You're listening to The Main Loop, a bi-monthly podcast all about what makes games interesting, engaging, and most importantly, fun to play. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Main Loop. This is episode 13. I am Sean Bragg, and joined once again, as always, and forevermore, Stuart Erbach. Yeah, and I'm not by myself anymore, so... No, you're... We're back. Don't have to suffer through that. We're a family again. It feels good to be back. So, a lot going on. Uh, Family vacation time is upon us, so travel dates and things like that but happy really happy to be back doing the show again so uh i think it's appropriate that we start like we unofficially do every week with the switch cast <laughs> what is that is that a <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a gaming system of some sort? The, yeah if i don't know if we've ever talking talking about it we've never talking about it before on the shows and we've uh, never we've, we've never Tekken about it. Oh, oh, that's a four. That's, yeah, that's a little teaser. Um, so switchcast time. Uh, Stu, is Arms actually good and interesting? Yeah. So I played the uh, the global punch test. Global global punch test, test punch. punch. Test global punch. test punch. There we go. <laughs> I knew it was a random combination of words that made no sense. But, I knew it had an S in it. <laughs> It was good. I I was really impressed at how the the controllers performed. I think it it's gonna like it's gonna be big. I think yeah. It's uh it's really fun. I think it has some competitive legs, and it was pretty cool. So I did not play the global test punch, the punch test test, and so I'm curious. Did you try it with motion controls and non motion controls? I only tried it with motion controls, actually, okay. not non-motion controls. Okay. Um, almost everything worked like a charm. Okay. It was pretty pretty awesome. Um, I think, yeah, punching is incredible. Uh, being able to, like, switch out uh, what your gloves do is pretty awesome. Each character has, like, three yeah. um, attacks for each of their gloves. Um, the only thing that got a little weird was the moving side-to-side. Okay. Um, you tilt. You basically rotate your your hands right or left to move. Okay. Um, and I felt like, and I think how quickly you move it depends on how far you're rotated, and that got weird a couple of times. Okay. I think. But aside from that, like blocking was really easy. Punching was really easy. Grappling was like super fun. That was easily the most fun part of the game. Because basically all you're doing is punching both arms out simultaneously. Yeah. Um, and then if it hits them, you pull them in and deal a bunch of damage. Okay. Um, and that was just very rewarding. Yeah, I watched IGN's video review of it, um, and they gave it a they gave it like an eight out of ten. They gave it a very high score, and they mentioned that grappling was extremely satisfying and did a lot of damage. The reviews that I've read and the video reviews I've watched all say that. If you want to take it seriously, though, you don't use motion controls. Like you play with controller mode. Yeah. And so I was curious to see if you'd played that because I, I would love to know what the difference feels like. What's the date on that thing? When is that coming out? It's like next week or the okay. week after. Yeah, it's like at the something? very end of E3. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm um, excited. It it looks actually watching that IGN video review made me think that I'm much more interested than I initially was, knowing that it has controller support instead of just. I was not interested in yeah. Wii Boxing 2.0, but knowing that you can play it in controller mode like a video game is really interesting to me. Well, the one thing I will say, though, like, you're right, you could not play competitive. I think it would be very hard to play competitively um, just with the motion controls. It's just very... It's not a perfect technology yet, right? If it was, I don't think we'd be making boxing games. Right. <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it handles significantly better than a Wii controller. Okay. Like it, it is a very different experience on the, um, on the, the two joy cons than it was on the Wii. So would you say where it's you're worth just like buying... thrusting your arm out? Yeah. 
Would you say it's worth buying another set of Joy-Cons to play motion controls like with a friend? Like to play local co-op with yeah, motion I mean, controls? I think, yeah, I think if you're going to do a lot of local playing, it's probably worth it. Because it's just, if you're playing like casually, I think it's a lot more worth it to do that than the... the um, Pro than like with a pro controller yeah. okay. i think i think if i'm playing online i think a pro controller you can't do it you can't do it with 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 just punchy punchy yeah because it's it just gets just too punchy frustrating punchy. that's what they're that's what they're called just the punchy yeah just punchy. punchy 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 cons the punch cons um, <laughs> <laughs> perfect you need two more punchy con i think i think it'll be a lot more fun locally with the punch cons because <laughs> the trash talk and like yeah the occasional glitches won't feel as 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 garbage right okay well that that's definitely what i yeah where i was i was wondering is is it is it does it have like replay beyond the because with the wii a lot of the wii motion control games not all of them but a lot of them once the novelty of the motion control wore off they weren't that fun to keep playing you know tennis was kind of the tennis and bowling were like the exception right tennis and bowling were always really fun the re- everything else that was motion controlled was just like okay a round of that was cool but I now I wish we could just play a game with like a real controller with actual game design <laughs> yeah you know an actual yeah. video game not a not a tech demo which is I understand the Wii was the most popular thing like ever until the Switch but just so many of the games just felt like and here's another tech demo of the Wii that's not yeah. an actual video game yeah, it was. It I think I think Wii Tennis was like the first time I felt truly old because I realized that the best way to play was to like snap my rotator cuff hard and like flick my wrist, <laughs> and I would do that like five times, and then my arm would just like hurt. Yep, and I'd be like, "Well, this, the, yeah, mm-hmm, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna go back to playing other video games." <laughs> yeah, nothing says your life is not quite together than a Wii Tennis injury. Well, how'd you uh, how'd you injure yourself? You just know, playing some tennis. Just ten- it's this the old tennis injury acting up again. It's the old, the tennis, old elbow. tennis. No, the the difference is unlike with the Wii controllers, where it was like, oh, this occasionally worked the way I want it. It's like, oh, this works almost a hundred percent the way I'm expecting. And then there's the occasional glitch. Got it. Cool. I, so, what's the deal with the punchy cons? How do they work? Since it's not sensor based like the Wii U, so it's not tracking. It's not tracking motion that way, right? It's just tracking rotation. Okay. So it's basically just a gyroscope. So, so the, they've the got con- little gyroscopes and accelerometers in them, more like a phone than tracking yeah. in space. Okay. Yeah. So it's more like if you're if your your arms always stay here, and then you rotate like in different. Um, methods to to say what you want to do. So, like a right rotate is gotcha is going right. Left rotate is going left. Uh, rotate in is block and punch is punch. See that that sounds like it would actually be I don't know because the Wii thing where it's trying to track you in physical space like with the sensor that's just always seems like garbage to me. Like the the connect the connect actually was really great I thought but I never liked the whole. You got to have the sensor bar here and you've got to calibrate with the sensor bar and make sure that you're doing it right. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's none of that from what I've seen anyway. Um, the, the, actually, I think the reason that one of the other main reasons I would not play competitively online with the punchy cons is that you want to punch too hard. Oh, like, you know, a generic right. punch is like a punch. Like there's no, there's no force on, on what it's calculating. It's like either punch or no. And I'll just be, I was just like, ugh. And then I would <laughs> punch the entire way for everyone who's listening to this podcast. I'm currently punching the air in front of There's my computer. He's, he's just punch dancing. It's great. And then I would realize that I was like overextended and I would have to like go back really far in order to reset my controller. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that got awkward. Okay, so pump the brakes a little bit on the punchy cons. But I think in terms of, like, competitive depth, like, each character has their own, like, powers and, like, play types. I think I think this one's got, got, got some legs. Cool. It's got arms. <laughs> uh, you, you could say. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. 
Okay, well, moving on through the Switchcast, uh, we got a Pokemon Direct this week, which yielded some very, very, very exciting uh, results for uh, 3DS owners. I have so many mixed feelings, Sean. <laughs> so 3DS people get Ultra Sun, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, which is updated versions of the Sun and Moon games, which I love, and... that, I love that they're just not even pretending anymore, like... We will make one new Pokemon game a decade, and then we will just re-release like the past eight Pokemon games as new versions, and then ten years later we'll make a new game, and we just keep this rolling rotation of re-releases going. It's great. Yeah, I mean, like it. Let, let's be honest: the number of viable Pokemon names in the world is probably one of the most limited resources <laughs> known to man. I'm actually really excited for the new whatever the next Pokemon is because we'll probably be able to catch Punchicon. Yeah, it, like <laughs> it'll just be like it'll be like Pencilly, and it'll just be a, like a a, <laughs> a, little, a type two pencil right. with some eyes. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, it's Nunchaku. He's literally a nunchuck. Like, oh, and it'll, they'll just have like the saddest backstories. <laughs> I just initially, want, I'm ready for the Pokemon that's just like go gun. And he's just literally a, a, a gun who just shoots other Pokemon, like because we're just they're just out of ideas. We've got Ice Cream Yo yeah. or whatever. We've got Soda Canicus, Envelope Mon. <laughs> oh Lord! So Paper Cut was ineffective. <laughs> Paper Cut was super effective. Oh my gosh! Are you kidding me? Pikachu bled out. <laughs> So I don't know if, if I've, I've got a, an old buddy, uh, Tim, who listens to the show sometimes and the word, just the word paper cut causes him to just recoil in horror and revulsion. <coughs> oh, so what you're saying is I lost like, like 20% of our viewers with that statement. <laughs> I'm saying we should just say paper cut a few more times and see if anybody else has these uh, sort okay. of issues. Uh, so back to the Fair. Pokemon uh, thing. We did not get a new Pokemon game for the Switch like we were hoping. This this Pokemon Stars thing that we were hoping for didn't didn't happen. Which I guess isn't to say that it, it won't. It, you could say it, it didn't appear. It it did not appear. A wild Pokemon Stars did not appear. Or if it did, it ran away immediately. So uh, we're going to keep shuffling in the tall grass for that. What we did get for the Nintendo Switch is uh, Pokken Tournament. And this is the fighting game that's all based on Pokemon that only came out for the Wii U. Was fairly well received, like a lot of Wii U games. So again, um, there were like 15, at least 15 people uh, in the world who played Pokemon Tournament on the Wii U. And it's coming to the Switch. It's like an updated version. Again, all the DLC stuff. I mean, I'm excited. It looks fun. It's it, You're actually controlling Pokemon as they beat the crap out of each other. And that's that's like the dream, right? Even Pokemon Stadium never really delivered what we really wanted, which is I want to control Machamp as I Machoke a my bitch. Um, I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> 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 just just pounding some of the news. <laughs> yeah, this is great. It's good to be back. We're just cutting loose. Uh, yeah. So, Pokemon tournament. Oh man, where? How do we recover? It's we're. It's only like thirteen minutes into this episode, and we already have an unrecoverable <laughs> error. <laughs> Sean and Stewart blacked out. <laughs> they rushed to the local Poke Center. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we did black out. Get us in there. If this was a Nuzlocke challenge, we would have to just cancel the podcast now. Just delete. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, I'm, I'm like, pretty excited about Pock, and I think it's going to be much more widely played just because it's on the Switch, and the Switch right. isn't the Wii U. And it seems like it, Zelda's entire marketing strategy for the next year and a half is just releasing Wii U games on the Switch. Yeah. Um, Zelda's, and that's then Zelda's pretending marketing like they're strategy. Brilliant. I did just I say want, Zelda? You did say that Z that's Zelda's marketing strategy, which is funny because the the Switch is the three hundred dollars Zelda machine that also plays other games, but it's the Zelda machine. They might as well rename yeah, the company I mean, Zelda Switch. <laughs> <laughs> the Zelda Switch guest. Yeah. Um, no, I mean they've got like a year and a half of of backlogged games that Nintendo can just release for the Switch now. And like they'll be good for a while. And what's funny is like I, I think there's so know, many people me, who didn't buy Wii U's. Like literally, there are millions of people who did not buy a Wii U. 
<laughs> and so there's so many games now. There's that a were, very, very large number. <laughs> yeah, most people actually did not buy Wii U's by a pretty huge percentage. And so I'm like, give me that Wind Waker HD remake. Give me, uh, was Skyward Sword a Wii U game? Because I never played that. Like, there's yep. plenty. The Hyrule Warriors. I I would like all of these. Punchy Con Sword. Yep. Yeah, Punchy Con Sword time. <laughs> Um, the, yeah, the I think you hit. I think the other thing from from Nintendo's perspective that I kind of read was I don't I think it's signaling to me that they want to show people, especially developers, that the 3DS isn't going anywhere. Yeah. And that like, oh, we're releasing we're re-releasing gold for it. We're re-releasing Sun and Moon. Sorry, Ultra Sun. Ultra um, Moon. To be like, hey guys, just because the Switch is out, you know, we're still supporting this. And yeah. I, cause I think if, if Pokemon Stars had been like a re implementation of Pokemon Black and White or Sun and Moon or whatever on the Switch, it would have like immediately been like, well, 3DS is gone. Yeah, that's fair. And, I, and from what, from all the marketing I've heard from, they're like, nope, we're very committed to this. So I can't. As much as I would just like die for a, a real Pokemon game on the Switch, I just can't imagine it happening for a while. It makes sense to me. They don't want to signal that they're killing the, the 3DS because it really does still have a place. There's a place for a a true portable that's you know maybe quote unquote less powerful, but that actually like you know encourages encourages gameplay experiences that are tailored to it versus more console grade stuff and. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people think that the 3DS is like one of the greatest game platforms of all time. So, kind of, kind of hard to argue against that one. Well, anyway, we can hold out hope for that uh, that Pokemon game to come one day. One day, our Pokemon, our Poke Prince, will come. But we should know more on uh, Tuesday. Uh, the when? What, Tuesday? When I think it was Tuesday. The thirteenth, pretty sure, is Nintendo's E3 panel, uh, which yep. looks like it's going to be short and sweet. They've got like thirty minutes. They're not like Bethesda. That's like, and here's our sixteen-hour panel. Nintendo is just going to hit it hard, whatever they're doing. And so we'll know. It looks like Super Mario Odyssey is going to be like the star of the show. So excited! Uh, I'm really so excited, excited to see more. I didn't realize that his hat has like eyes. Like his hat is actually a little character. Uh, in yeah, the, the theory in, is that it's like some sort of bunny magic. Of of course, I, I I love that you just said that. Like you know, it's it's some sort of bunny magic. <laughs> Thanks, Napoleon Dynamite. Oh no, we lost you. We lost him. <laughs> it's it's evil bunny magic. Oh, Run amok. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, he's back. I no, I'm I'm sorry. I, I spoke. No, no, I'm I'm actually not even joking about this. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. I know you're not. I just love the how matter of fact you stated. It's some kind of bunny magic, you know. It's like obviously <laughs> bunny magic, which is a normal thing to to talk about all the time. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Anyway, um. Oh, where are you going, It Stu? looks like it's going to be good. Okay, okay. There we go. Oh, damn it. I'm worried that we we mocked the bunny magic, and now we're, we've invoked the bunny curse on our Skype feed. Yep, there's, there's just bunnies for days. Bunnies for days. Speaking of bunnies. Oh, man. Are we about to talk about rabbits? Yes. Uh, yes, we are about to talk about... Rabbids. Uh, so this thing <laughs> that has not been announced yet has it been? A, I, has it been really announced, or is it still just leaked? It's it all it just was like leaked, but then leaked plus, and then it seems like it's pretty much confirmed, but no one's actually said it's confirmed. Yeah. So it's this Mario Rabbids. That's what they're called, right? Rabbids. I think the so. Rayman Ra- Rabbids like thing. A name. They're the little white turds that run around and, I don't know, cause hijinks. So this looks like it might actually be like some sort of like new Mario RPG type game 
that's somehow weapon it i mean i can't get my head around this thing it's weapon based you've got rabbits you've got peach and toad and you've got rabbits dressed like rabbit toad. toad rabbit toad right, rabbit. yeah rabbit peach um, oh my god so i i don't know other than for the weirder it gets the more excited i get for it yeah i mean that's nintendo's like other marketing strategy it's like oh let's just instead of like making it we'll make more zelda and mario games and then we'll also just like make it weirder so more squids uh people yeah. with curly arms and then rabbits and and peach because you know totes why wouldn't we <laughs> perfectly logical sean i like it well i think that's gonna do it for the nintendo switch cast portion of today's <laughs> episode so uh let's move on to a couple of other things uh in the pc gaming world i want to talk about i just have in my notes here Criperion's anticlimax which is it's just a great bullet point i'm really glad that i put it in there like that uh <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know who Criperion is he is i believe he's actually the top hearthstone streamer on twitch yeah. which is interesting to me because it's just interesting. If you've watched the stream, you'll know why it's interesting that he's the most popular. I mean, he's got great insight, but he's he is a cranky he's a cranky man. I don't know. He's like far and away the most entertaining of all the streamers I've I've seen. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Well, he's been doing this thing since 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 the very early days of Hearthstone. Um, if you're not familiar with Hearthstone, one of the things that's great about it is when you buy packs of cards. Any duplicate cards you get can be broken down for this stuff called arcane dust, and you can use that to actually craft cards you don't have. So it's their way of you don't have to just keep sinking money into it. You can actually you can actually build some stuff. Uh, it's pretty great. But he has been saving his dust from all of his card packs for almost what it's like three and a half years at this point. Yeah, it's like close to the beginning of Hearthstone. Yeah. So there's the big button that you there's a big button that you can click that says disenchant all duplicates and it'll show you how much dust you're going to get. And his original plan, uh, if I remember correctly, was he was going to uh, just save up until he had enough dust to craft every card, the golden version of it, which is the more expensive one. But he realized that now Blizzard is actually uh, coming out with new content too fast and there's just no way he'll ever be able to actually do that. So mm. he pushed the button um, to much fanfare. He finally pushed the button for it was like 660,000 dust or something like that. Well, and the other thing was apparently he had to be in contact with Blizzard about this because a lot of other people had threatened to push the to dust at the same time. Oh, because they were hoping that if they dusted at the same time he did, it would crash the server and then they would get a lot of free dust because they were like breaking because because customer service oh man. got it so like their actual fear wasn't like crip just alone breaks the server it was also like oh and then we'll have to give out free cards to like a bunch of jackasses <laughs> that makes sense uh which is funny because the button did crash the hearthstone game client um, which is why it was the most anticlimactic thing. We're ready, and then we click the button, and instead of the cool animation of all the dust flying around and going into the little pot of gold or whatever, there was just a few minutes of nothing, and then just the game <laughs> just exited, just done. Perfect. And then when he logged back in, he had all the dust. So uh, that I remember discussions every new expansion in Hearthstone when Crip would be opening lots of card packs and sounded like he'd been sort of asked by blizzard to hey on day one of the expansion please don't click the button because yeah. <laughs> like the servers are already overrun with people opening and buying new packs and then you might actually just break the game for everybody <laughs> so the button's been pushed it's it's over the dream is dead um in one of the most anticlimactic things i've ever watched which kind of actually made it awesome so yeah what are we going to do with our lives now like, now that the button's that been pushed I, I have I have to say I have to admit something um, and that is that I I uninstalled Hearthstone pretty much everywhere probably two months ago now maybe maybe it's just over that 
and my life has actually been so much happier because I was, I was in such a rut of, I want to play Hearthstone. Oh, there's still, there's three good decks oh. and like, that's it. And then congrats on just so many things you can't control. I find I finally got to that point of like, after defending all the, all the randomness and all the chance in that game for so long, I was such a fan of it. I, I, I it finally broke me. I finally was just like, there's just, there's just not enough I can control in this game. It just feels like I just get like in the old days of like, Oh, you play against Hunter, you get punished for playing minions or you playing against priest, you get punished for having minions or it just, I don't know. It just stopped being fun. And so I actually, I quit Hearthstone, which is pretty crazy. Cause that was like my main game for probably two and a half, three years. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think card games and fighting games have the same problem that at some point, there's just like so much memorization and it just becomes like a huge rock, paper, scissors thing that either you're really good and like that's fun because you can like play around and you, you'll probably still win or you have a really good shot or you just like don't have 40 hours a week to invest in it and then it just gets tough to stay on. Yeah. And I, I just felt like I had gotten into so many situations where it felt like I was playing the game well and playing it right. And then it was still just this last minute, like I've built a really good board. I've answered all your good stuff. And then, you know, it's just this perfect draw or some random element of like summon a random minion or draw a random spell just has the perfect turnaround and just feeling like, man, like I actually out, like there's nothing worse to me than feeling like you actually played better than your opponent. And it didn't matter. Like at the end of the day, it didn't come down to who played best. It came down to, you know, it came down to a, a die roll and I get that that's a lot of games, but that it felt like that feeling was happening more and more for me. I didn't realize this was going to turn into Sean's like emotional rant about Hearthstone, but I, I had to get it off my chest. I finally, I kind of was done and it, it, it had stopped really stopped being fun for me. Yeah. I think it's just, it's yeah, it's hard in card games, especially to, especially at, lower levels as a game matures to like make that fun yeah and i think you know i think magic also kind of runs into it from time to time where it's like yeah this is great but also it kind of feels like there's one way to play and you're kind of just hoping you draw correctly and your opponent doesn't right well that kind of actually leads to this next uh point here Stu. you actually wanted to uh kind of share your thoughts sort of comparing what are really the the two big card games now which is hearthstone on the digital side and then magic the gathering which still nobody has i mean nobody has come close to touching magic on the actual physical card game side i mean there's lots of good games yeah, out there, I mean, but it, they're just it's just at this point it's just so dominant i was i don't know i was kind of just really interested in why from some of the comments i had seen from pros um, on both in both Hearthstone and Magic, like why it felt like Magic continually got solved quicker hmm. um, than Hearthstone. And what's interesting is like, you know, a lot of the traditional arguments just kind of fall down. You know, Hearthstone has more players; it's a less complex game. Um, there's more money in it. There's like significantly more money in Hearthstone than there is Magic. So like, you would assume that. And there's a much smaller design team. I think like team five is significantly smaller than wizards play team overall. Um, in terms of just like the number of game designers working on it. Um, that's not to say the overall like coding and art team is smaller. Obviously it probably isn't, but so I just like kind of step by step walked through the elements of the game. Yeah. Um, the games and like just kind of tried thinking about what, what was different for each of them. Um, and I'm not going to walk through point by point here. Um, but kind of what it came down to was the, the fundamental part of magic, which is sort of the land system. Um, actually there's, there's two parts to magic, which are kind of interesting. One is the land system where you have to like put mana in your deck in order to draw it. Right. So, um, in actuality, um, magic will actually draw fewer sort of spell cards throughout the game than hearthstone. Um, even though there's, you start with seven cards, um, and there's also uh, attacking and blocking is different. Yeah. 
Um, so in Hearthstone, you attack the player. Um, you or you you choose who you attack. The attacker gets to choose. So there's emphasis on being the attacker is a positive thing from just sort of a broad game design perspective. Yeah. Um, whereas in Magic, it's actually the opposite. Uh, the defender gets to choose whether or not to block. Um, and so what that means is, for example, something like Stone Tusk Four in Hearthstone. Um, it's a one-one haste for one, basically. Sorry, charge for one is a much more powerful card in Hearthstone because the opponent can't respond to it. They can't do anything right. about it. Whereas in Magic, a 1-1 one, one haste for one is a throwaway card because the opponent gets to choose whether or not to block it. Um, and so we've seen this most recently with the Rogue Quest where Stone Tusk Bore has just exploded because five turns into the game, it becomes a 5-5 five, five haste for one. Yeah. Whereas in Magic, like it's fine because... You can choose to block it or not. You don't. If it becomes a five-five, it can't just attack your face. You get to choose to block it. Um, and so, what's interesting about this, from like a bigger game design perspective, is in order to continually make magic fun, which I think the designers have, they have to put cards that encourage attacking and discourage blocking. Um, and what that means is beefier creatures, creatures that reward attacking, creatures that punish blocking. The problem is a lot of the strategic excitement in Magic actually comes from attacking and blocking. But what they found is with newer players, it tends to, if you just give them a bunch of creatures, you'll end up in these like board states where everyone has like 13 creatures and no one wants to attack because people are bad at deciding when to like make strategic decisions like that unless they're encouraged. Um, and so what that encourages is basically battle cruiser magic is what they call it where you just like create a, f a few really good like strong creatures that it's very obvious you want to attack with them and then that reward players heavily for attacking with them mm. and what that means is that actually overall decreases the interaction in the game i think and makes it strategically less complex because it becomes very obvious which card is um sort of the best in any given metagame whereas with hearthstone sort of because it's very um, attack-minded already, you don't have to introduce cards that sort of encourage good gameplay. It's already there. It, it, it's by default. Uh, you just get it for free. And so you can kind of balance the game more flatly, I think. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, obviously, the counterpoint to that is because Hearthstone is less random, um, you know, you don't have a 60-card deck. You have a 30-card deck. Right. Any single... Any single mechanic can become out of control much more quickly. And what I mean by that is, in Magic, um, even if you have a really strong mechanic that's on multiple cards, the chances of that mechanic happening repeatedly are pretty small within any given deck. Um, whereas with Hearthstone, something like Jade, for example. Yeah. Um, oh, Jade. On a couple of cards, you know, it's not a bad, it's not a crazy mechanic. It's like, oh, this is kind of cool. But because so many cards can just appear in a given deck very, very predictably, right. that's, that's the sort of challenge that Hearthstone has. And I think um, sort of moving forward, the challenge that Magic has to sort of deal with is how do you continue to create interesting, complex game states without sort of leaning on, oh, we just have to make sort of these types of cards so that newer players can feel like they're having fun. Um, and I think that's that's sort of a balance that Magic's going to have to strike just because it is sort of living with a, a legacy design system right. um, that Hearthstone kind of evolved past. Yeah. Well, I think, too, there's that hard part, right? In, in Hearthstone and in Magic, they both have the challenge of having to keep new players in mind. Um, and that's something that, right. you know, you've heard Team 5 from Hearthstone talk about a lot of we didn't do X even though a lot of the established or pro players wanted it because we do have to think about people who are going to play the game for the first time. We want them to have fun and keep playing the game and magic. I feel like it has even more cause I, I still have played very little magic. I mean, I've played most of my magic games against you because it's still intimidating to go to like a Friday night magic or something because some of these people have been playing this game for freaking ever and yeah, it's so literally it's, two yeah. and a half decades. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And so it's so established and it's so it's got such a legacy that it, it feels very intimidating for a new player, especially 
I'm probably not alone in being somebody who likes video games and fantasy stuff and is also fairly introverted and not always the best at like, let's go be around new people. So that factor of how do we get people to actually just come in and like give us a shot? Like you will have fun if you come play our game and we have to like the game itself has to entice you. You know, there has to be a marketing element of the game itself. Um, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully I'll, I'll sort of get that full write up published here pretty soon, but, um, just kind of wanted to talk through some of the interesting conclusions I sort of hadn't thought about before I just like kind of sat down and was like, Oh, let me, let me just compare what, what these two games do kind of differently. And I was, I was surprised to see, um, just how much a couple of those design decisions really did change sort of the overall structure of the games. Yeah. Well, I think too, to me, like the, the, the biggest thing that, that like the breakdown between the two games and I think is why, and I think why Hearthstone has had so much, like has just blown up the way it has. I mean, it's insane is because in Hearthstone, you are passive on your opponent's turn. Like there is nothing you can do. Uh, in magic, you have to be on the whole time, right? It's, you can't pass your turn and then, okay, I'm just going to kind of sit back, watch and learn what's going on. You have, you might have cards. I mean, how many games you and I played when I was learning and it was like, Oh crap, wait, no, I think I have a thing that cancels that. Like, stop, (laughs) stop killing me. I can make you not kill me. Um, and trying to keep track of that was really tough. Um, whereas in Hearthstone, you just don't have that. It's not a thing. You just, all you do is you you play your cards and make your moves and then you pass and then you just watch what your opponent does and that makes it a much easier game to start and to get into but it's also there's so many things in hearthstone that i'm like man if there was just an interrupt system of some if yeah some, like if every <laughs> class just had like one or two interrupt spells where you could do deal two damage on can be can be cast on your turn or you know can't like anything that's that's some sort of counterplay system like this game would actually would to me would would be a lot more fun um just because if there was actually more counterplay because that's the biggest thing in hearthstone it feels like sometimes you just can't do it you just sit back and just get the crap kicked out of you for 10 turns and then you get you yeah, end you're the just game on rails. And, yeah and then well. you're just like why am i even playing this like i can't i can't do anything to combat this whereas in magic i really like the stack and the counterplay opportunity yeah, and I, I think my fear is that, like, as Magic tries to compete with Hearthstone, it will downplay that mm. um, in efforts to, like, win new players. And I'm hoping that as they sort of embrace sort of becoming more of an esport and, like, a competitive esport, that sort of, like, looking at things like Dota and League, which are significantly more complicated than yeah. some of their, like, compatriots. Um, are still successful because of the complexity. Yeah. I um, mean, they kind of embrace that instead of uh, sort of shying away from it. Well, and, and any, any game that involves counterplay has this, a much more like the ceiling on its enjoyment is so much higher because there's things you can get better at. You can get better at adapting to certain strategies or certain movements and responding to different game states versus you know hearthstone can be very rock paper scissors it's like each turn i did my thing and now let's see what you got and okay i'll i'll do my thing now whereas in something like magic or like you mentioned in these like mobas that are they're like the biggest games in the world now it's all about we have our strategy but we also have to be actively responding to what our team is doing and aware of what's going on and you can actually get better at that um because at the end of the day i don't know it feels like the skill ceiling on Hearthstone is is it's it's high, but it's definitely like you hit it, and then it's just kind of like okay. Other than you play lots and lots and lots of games, and so you just know kind of what to do in each situation more. But there's not like there's right. a ton of room to keep getting better. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of there's quite as much tactical. Yeah. Um, growth possible that's not to say it's not there and that's not to say like you master it super quickly because you don't and you can see pro, pro players are just way better at it but um it gets the differentiation gets smaller really really fast right. as opposed to something like magic where i feel like the differentiation is still pretty huge even at like pro play 
hmm. um, where it's a little bit where like maybe the top level pros are still the top level pros, but there's like five tiers of them instead of like, you know, two. Yeah. Well, so you are going to write a whole bunch about that, right? You're going to, you're going to really open up this can of worms on the old, the old blogosphere. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure if anyone read it, I would be getting flamed out, but they probably won't. So, <laughs> so it's probably a positive for being honest. <laughs> It's that's great. Can't can't get flamed out if nobody reads your blog. <laughs> it's brilliant, exactly. It's brilliant. Well, I think that's going to about do it for this week's main loop. Uh, this has been a great, great episode. Uh, I thought so. I mean, I don't know what our listeners think, but I'm I'm going this. We knocked this one out of the park. We really two out of two punchy cons. Two out of two punchy cons. Absolutely. Uh, really, really good work, everyone. Uh, go ahead and take the week off. So, uh, if you like this show which we hope you do uh, because that's why we do it. Uh, it would be kind of dumb to make a show that people don't like. So if you like the show, uh, you can really help us out by leaving a review on the iTunes store um, or on Google play. Uh, but iTunes actually really has the biggest impact. So if you listen to us, if you subscribe through iTunes and whatever app you're using device you're using, if you want to pop over to the iTunes store, leave a review for the show. Uh, it helps more people find the show really helps us know that we're doing okay. Um, and then we would love your feedback, uh, not just about the show in general. So just email us about how Stu's wrong about Hearthstone or Magic or why we shouldn't call him Punchy Cons or why Sean shouldn't say he's going to machoke my, you know, the thing you said earlier. Uh, you can email us, mainloopshow at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Sean M. Bragg. And you can find Stu uh, a couple different places. Can you? I don't even know anymore. I feel like I've gone into a dead zone of the social media sphere. Uh, well, you're going to write some stuff on your blog, which is... I will. <laughs> Do you don't know where your blog is? Amateur mythology? I don't know where it is. Uh, I, I was, was... going to Google how to find my blog, actually. No, was... <laughs> Pretty sure it's amateurmythology.wordpress.com. That sounds right. That sounds vaguely correct. Yeah. And then also you've got Decode Games on Instagram. Oh, yeah, on Instagram. That's a thing. Uh-huh. That's totally a thing. So places, but yeah, we'd love your love your emails. Let us know what you think of the show. Leave us an iTunes review. It should be great. I don't, I'm don't. i worried I'm starting to sound like a YouTuber. Go ahead and smash that uh, subscribe button and uh, hit us a follow and give us a thumbs up. Uh, we don't want to do lower that. Left. We don't want to do that. But uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back in two weeks. We will have some post E three stuff to talk about, which is going to be oh, great. Yeah. We'll have played some arms at that point. It's going to be a whole, whole brave new world. Whole new world. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will see you in two weeks. See it.